tuning in to the Postmodern Realities Podcast, brought to you by the Christian Research Institute and the Christian Research Journal. I'm Melanie Cogdill, Managing Editor of the Christian Research Journal. It's September 2021, and this is episode 252, which is a conversation about how Christians should handle and think theologically about the death of a beloved pet. Today's guest is Anne Kennedy, who has an MDiv and is the author of Nailed It, 365 Readings for Angry or Worn Out People, and blogs about current events and theological trends at Preventing Grace on Pathios.com. Anne has written an in-depth online exclusive article called Meditation Upon the Death of a Pet, and as one of their subscribers benefits, our subscribers can read her article for free at our website, Equip.org. If you'd like to read her book review and are not already a subscriber, please go to Equip.org to subscribe to our magazine. Anne, it's good to have you on. It's great to be here. Thank you. Well, this is kind of a sobering conversation that we're going to have today because it's about the death of pets, which to some people may seem not a big deal, but to anyone who's had a pet, knowing that God created these creatures and they do bring some joy into our lives or our family's lives or our kids' lives. It is something to grapple with when our pets die. And that happened to me in the past year. I had a pet that I didn't have for very long, actually only nine months, a a little dog who died super unexpectedly. So how should we deal with this subject? In fact, we get this at CRI all the time. People want to know, you know, Will my pet be in heaven? Or how do I think of my pet? Do they have a soul? So how's the death of an animal different than the death of a person? Because that's really sometimes the question, you know, will I see my pet again? Even if it's a really long time family pet. It is interesting. I, I lost a dog and a cat during COVID, as well as about eight or 10 people I knew um, didn't die of COVID necessarily, but died just as a result of being in nursing homes and not getting the screenings they needed. And then I lost both my grandparents from old age. And I spent a lot of the year being really grieved over the people that they sort of, they seem people were dying at regular uh, intervals. Uh, It was really tough. And then uh, when my dog died, I really came unglued in a way that I hadn't before. And I was surprised by that, but I had seen that happen to other people that, you know, they lose their mother and then their cat dies and they're basically okay when their mom is dying. But then when their cat dies, they just, you know, they're not okay for a really long time. So there's this, it's an interesting relationship, I think between, well, every death is its own terrible thing but somehow when an animal dies that you're close to it unlocks some kind of grief that is even more terrible if that makes sense and yeah so thinking about why that is is really the, the scriptures speak about all of creation but it's really you know if you look through the bible it's it's the death of people that's so terrible so of the place that i went to to kind of start to answer the question was john wesley's wonderful wonderful sermon called the general deliverance and between him and lewis they the way that they talk about the created order and how god designed adam and eve's relationship with the animals in particular how it was supposed to be in the beginning shows some insight into why we, why when an animal, and I would say probably any innocent creature, like a baby, for instance, when a child dies, it's different than when a, an adult person with a long life dies. The question of innocence adds a layer of, of grief that is harder to bear when it seems like an animal dies and they didn't do anything to deserve it, you know, and you can't stop it. Your own helplessness factors in and a, and amps up the grief. And then I also think that there's a, a residual or vestigial grief over the loss of the beauty of creation when Adam and Eve were in the garden and they had a perfect relationship with the created order. With, at least it wasn't 
fallen yet. God was their God, but they were supposed to be God to the animals. They were supposed to care for them really the way that God cares for us. And when they fell, they couldn't do that anymore. And so anytime you run up against the horror of death, when you are helpless in that, you're sort of vaguely reminded of Eden, I think, in a a terrible and grievous way. And of course, none of that is conscious, you know, Mostly, it's just the loss of a creature that you had relied on emotionally um, for comfort and just companionship. That's the foremost experience. But I think that the energy that you see around the death of pets for people, especially non-Christians, says something really profound about the relationship that we should have had with the created order more than any other you know, catastrophe that happens. And do you think it is more for, especially when we talk about death of pets, I did have a reptile, a bearded dragon that died, and that was sad. And I know some people have, you know, fish and things. But when we talk about pet death, we're normally talking about some kind of mammal, like, you know, somebody's bunny or their cat or their dog. And specifically cats and dogs, they don't have souls, like human beings have souls but they have emotions. I mean, they do have happiness or fear or any of those other things. And so is it affect us, you think, because there's here's a creature with emotions that depend on us, especially if they're domesticated pet versus seeing, you know, one of those National Geographic, you know, animals out in the wild thing and something happens to them. But it's just like they domesticated animals rely on us. They do. And they have personalities. You know, they have some kind of not personhood, like human personhood, but, you know, it's easy to anthropomorphize them, of course, because they, you know, they respond to human affection and love in really personable ways. And so when you, you know, you have a relationship with some creature and you, in your mind and your emotions, elevate that creature up almost to many times to the status of human, (laughs) more and more so as our culture goes on, of course. And the dependence that, you know, you take care of the animal. So you shouldn't be helpless when something bad happens. You should be able to fix everything and you can't. So it's not just that death reigns. It's that we continue to fail to solve the problem of death on our own. And yeah, I think the, you know, Lewis in the Narnia books is very much riffing off of well, I don't know exactly if he was doing this, but it seems like he was riffing off of John Wesley. The the animal, as it's related to humanity, it grows and has a more and greater relationship and eventually even language, you know, or at least the ability to communicate with humanity in a bigger and more complete way than you know, obviously now you can't really understand what animals think and feel or what's going on in their minds, even though we, of course, project ourselves onto them and think that we can. So you just kind of hinted at it a little bit a few moments ago, but just for Christians to think through this topic, because, you know, we need to think through it before we experience it sometimes so that it can help us deal with going through mourning the death of a pet. But, you know, how did God order the cosmos before the fall in Genesis 3, especially in regards to, you know, the relationship between animals and man? I mean, the order that God creates the world, you know, is so gorgeous. It's a very providential ordering in just the order in which he creates. So everything's in place including the animal kingdom by the time man comes along and he's the crown and glory of creation but all of the work and the beauty of the care of creation was there waiting for him ready for him and so he was i think you know i'm trying to imagine it in my mind's eye that it would have been 
well, of course, before the fall, the work that he was given to do would have been really satisfying. But part of it was, you know, categorizing, naming, understanding. I would have said maybe the habitats of all the creatures and what they needed, just as God had arranged everything for him. He would go and the work that he would do in the cosmos was to take care of it and have dominion over it and arrange it and think about it and wonder, you know, take care of the creatures. So it seems to me like a wonderful kind of zoo that God creates, not animals in cages, but the very affectionate relationship between Adam and all the creatures. And of course, the lack that he feels he needs Eve to help him. And so, you know, she's brought into this wonderful garden of animals and, you know, vegetation and creatures and I think they, you know, all the the pictures that you see of Adam and Eve wandering around the garden eating fruit, I mean, that obviously what they were doing, but they were supposed to work. They were supposed to take care of it. And, you know, I have no idea how they would do that without any tools or anything. And God had given everybody everything that he needed. But obviously God created the world to be managed and to be taken care of. So I think, you know, when you're taking care of your dog, your little dog, or I, you know, I have a big dog now trying to walk it down the street is really hard. There's supposed to be an intimate, affectionate relationship between me and the creatures around me. It's not supposed to be broken. And there's remnants of that. You feel it and you experience it in relationships with cuddly animals. Of course, yeah, the bearded dragon, maybe not a deep emotional relationship with, but, um, (laughs) My father grew up loving snakes and always wished that he could catch them because he thought they were so wonderful. But he grew up where there were a lot of poisonous snakes and that was not a good idea. But the affection that people feel for creation would have been there, I think, before the fall. And that's given by God. And it's a good and right to foster that and work on that and try to have it as we approach the earth and all that is in it still, even though it's so broken and so ruined. You're listening to the Postmodern Realities podcast brought to you by the Christian Research Institute and the Christian Research Journal. One of the really exciting things about this podcast is to look at the statistics of how many people listen every month. And we have thousands of downloads of all of these episodes every month. And so we're really grateful for everyone that's listening And we'd like to ask you to help us out in a couple of ways. One is just keep getting the word out, even if it's word of mouth, but better yet, if you're sharing specific episodes that you enjoy on your social media feeds or emailing the link to a friend, that just lets more people find out about the podcast. The other way that more people find out about the podcast is just through searching on various platforms. And when a podcast has a lot of reviews, it just comes up as suggested more often. So we're trying to get to 100 reviews now. We only have a little bit over 60, so that's pretty ambitious. But we're hoping by the end of this year, by December 31st, that we can reach that goal. And if we do, we are giving away a free subscription to the Christian Research Journal. And that will go to anybody that writes a short one to two sentence review on Apple Podcasts, which is the main platform right now where people are writing reviews. If you could head on over there and just write a simple sentence about what you like about this or even a comment about what you'd like to see improved or a guest you'd like to see on. That's helpful too. So just head on over there and help us to add to our number to get us to 100 reviews. I think we need almost 40 more. So if you could do that, we'd be very grateful. And if you're not already a subscriber and you're enjoying this episode and would like to read Anne's article about thinking through the biblical view of seeing a death of a pet. And if you're not already a subscriber, go to equip.org and subscribe for 3350 because you'll get access to all of the online exclusive articles as well as the print magazine itself, which those articles are not on our website at this time. Usually they come up there much, much later. So you'd be able to read all these articles and just keep them as a great resource. So thank you for your partnership. Well, earlier you just mentioned that people invest emotional energy in their pets. And actually, I think that's probably an understatement because just the amount of 
how large the pet industry is, not just for, you know, healthcare for the pet, but just gadgets and gizmos and toys and things you can buy in clothes. People dress their pets in clothes. Actually, I have a very small breed dogs that are like five pounds. So in the winter when it gets cold, they actually do need a sweater. So those kinds of things. So is it okay for Christians to even invest emotional energy in pets? I know non-Christians certainly do, but what about for Christians? Is it okay to be invested or have a bunch of pets, have more than one pet, for example? I mean, I think it's the most godly thing you can do is to have a lot of pets. I'm biased because I really love animals, but I'm a little bit suspicious of people who say, well, I don't like any animals at all, or I've never had a pet and I don't want one. I think, oh, are you even saved? I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> of course, you can be a Christian without having pets or loving animals. God will forgive you in the new heavens and the new earth. But I do think that Christians should, of all people, take care of the helpless and weak, and that includes the animal kingdom and the environment and the oceans and anything that we come across that needs care, we should take care of. And I think that that is an emotional thing. That's a, an affectionate and loving care. And so it's okay to invest emotional energy in the pets that you have, for sure. I do think there should be a critical difference between the way that somebody who doesn't have a relationship with God and a Christian's relationship to their pets. And that's that just like with people, you should be there for the care of that animal and to love that animal in a selfless way and not use the animal as a prop for your own, you know, lack. And that's a very fine line because it means you would have to rely on God rather than yourself or rather than the animal for all the emotional stuff that you need. And that's very hard to do. So that's why most of us have pets is because we need a prop of some kind. And yet I do think Christians should be wary of that and should be there in a selfless way for the animal rather than devouring the soul of the animal or the personality of the animal or, or making it all about you, which is really hard to do. And I say that as somebody who is a little bit obsessive about my animals. So I'm saying this in an ideal sense and not as something that I'm good at. So in what ways would, you know, just for us to kind of unpack what you just said there, in what ways is emotional investment or the care of pets really been broken by sin in the fall? I think, you know, well, Adam and Eve, when they turned away from God, and turned away from each other and turned away from creation. They experienced a horrible isolation. They devolved back on themselves, and that resulted in an unraveling of the created order to one degree or another, although God, by his common grace, keeps it together. But, you know, they were alienated from each other, and of course then creation became something to be consumed rather than to, to take care of. And the creation became fallen. So I'm sure that the animals that went out of the garden when the garden was taken away and Adam and Eve were sent into the wilderness alone, that those creatures, well, New Testament says that they groan under their affliction. And I think in our lives, when we try to take care of animals or, you know, we we're neglectful, we are selfish, we make it all about us, we're thoughtless often. All of that in those first few minutes of the fall, you know, they continue to go on and it gets worse. I mean, it. the Bible promises that everything's going to get worse and worse. Our relationships with each other is going to get worse as we go towards the end. And creation is going to be destroyed more and more by us and by tumultuous earthquakes and wars and you know it's you can experience it on a, a macro level by reading the news or watching sarah mclaughlin's video or advertisement to all those poor dogs in cages <laughs> but you can experience it in a micro way in your own life by just not doing a good job of having animals or or being too good at it and not privileging people and your relationships with people over the animals that you have it should really be, you know, that you are related to God and then other people and then creation and the order 
should still be there. And of course, we are so disordered, we muck it all up all the time. So you mentioned earlier, sometimes we feel the loss of a pet even more than like somebody we know that's an acquaintance that died. I mean, not, of course, a family member, but, you know, somebody that we know passed away. We're sad, but maybe not as sad as if one of our pets passed away. And so kids feel this, too. In fact, that's probably one of the first experiences they really have with grasping the idea that there's death and something's not coming back is when they have a pet that dies. So how should Christian parents help kids understand biblically, you know, the death of the pet and and to grieve the death in a proper way? I think this is really a place where you could do wonderful catechesis for your child. You know, you could really disciple them into the Christian faith. But I think more what usually happens is that whenever death happens, children are told the most strange theological (laughs) non-truths available, they all come out at death, especially to children. So when somebody dies, you know, their children are often said, oh, well, they're, you know, they got their wings or they're in heaven or they're, you know, they're the dew that falls on the grass now, or grandma's always with you. They're in a better place. You know, grandma's always with you now in your heart, which always freaked me out. But then, yeah, when pets come along and die, it gets even worse. I think because, I mean, I've heard a lot of strange things said to children, but really what you should say to your child is that, you know, it's a chance to articulate the gospel that creation is broken and ruined and death reigns because we disobeyed God and rejected him. And we did not want the beautiful things that he had given us. We wanted to do things our own way. And animals suffer under that. You know, they are afflicted because of our sin, even when it's not direct. It's just a general state of affliction and grief for animals. And when they die, their bodies go in the ground. And actually, we don't know what happens to animals. Like when we die, our souls, our bodies go in the ground and our souls go either into a place of comfort and consolation, uh, the bosom of Abraham, or into a place of separation from God forever. When the resurrection comes, you get your body back with your soul, and then there's a new heaven and a new earth. We'll all live on the new earth together. We don't know what happens to the whatever it is of the animal, the personality of the animal when it dies, how God keeps that. He doesn't say, but we do know that nothing that it God creates is going to be lost. He's going to remake all of it. So on the, I think it's what I've told my children, when God comes back, Jesus comes back and everybody gets their body reunited with their soul. I think that all the animals that we loved will participate in that general resurrection and the new heaven and the new earth will be full of creatures that we knew and loved and took care of. And we'll have a second chance, I think, to relate to God's creation. So when an animal dies, the deep longing that you feel for restoration, that's good. And you should cry out to God along with the rest of creation and groan and ask him to restore everything and not enjoy in like a flat sense, but really relish the greater and greater longing that you feel for God to come back and be all in all for us and for all whom he has made. Well, I became a first time dog owner two years ago. I never owned dogs prior to that in my life. And so just trying to find information, how to take care of dogs, you know, Facebook, I guess we think we join Facebook groups where people have similar breeds. And it was there that I encountered for the first time when people's dog of my breed passed away, that there'd be these long threads of people saying, you know, I'll pray for them. I'm not really sure how that impacts a deceased pet, but also these kind of memes of something called the rainbow bridge. I I was just like, what is the rainbow bridge? And people just, you know, person after person, hundreds of comments deep saying, take comfort in the rainbow bridge. So what is the rainbow bridge? I had never heard about it before two years ago. 
I learned about it about 10 or more years ago when my cat died. I paid a lot of money for a cat that then died, you know, through her illness, trying to keep her from dying. And then she died anyway. And the vet gave me a copy, a physical copy of the Rainbow Bridge, which is some people call it a poem, but it's not really a poem. It is a paragraph about what happens to your animal when it dies. I don't, probably you don't want me to read it because you can just Google it, but it seems to be sort of like a Valhalla-esque Norse mythology idea where there's a plain, a grassy place, and when your animal dies, it goes there and plays with all the other animals and waits for you to die, and then when you die, you arrive in this grassy place and your animal is waiting for you there and he sees you and he comes running and then the two of you go over the rainbow bridge together into some place it doesn't say <laughs> it doesn't sound like heaven though and people take immense comfort from this poem i don't know if people actually believe that that's what happens when pets die but you're right it's shared everywhere it's handed out by very normal looking reasonable people still talk about the rainbow bridge as if it's perfectly rational or <laughs> or a thing to hope for i found it to be creepy myself i don't like the idea of my poor animal waiting there for ages for me to die and join them i think that creation was created to worship god no matter what part of it, it you know all of creation is filled with the glory of god so when your animal dies i'm sure that god somehow glorifies himself in some way or you know prepares to do that at the final resurrection but no the rainbow bridge is an american trope that i don't really understand and it's out there i think it's a good opportunity if somebody gives you this poem to say you know as a christian be pointed toward it and say oh that's that's so interesting well you know i actually think that god <laughs> is going to restore all of creation, and that includes the animals. And you're not the center of everything for all eternity for your animal, nor for yourself. And so also we are not Norse pagans. So you can just, you should put your faith in Jesus. Although I have seen some memes of a white Jesus at the Rainbow Bridge at the field. Oh my uh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, okay, people want to know, it's obviously it's not the Rainbow Bridge. So what happens to their dog or cat? Usually that's what people are wondering about. Some people have other exotic animals, but you know, what happens to their dog or cat when they die? I mean, I, I'm not sure. I hope that they all go you know, the personalities of all animals go straight into the place of consolation where Lazarus found himself when he died. And we all will, if you're in Christ, I hope that God, you know, that all around his throne are all the creatures that have died and are there, you know, basking in his light and his glory. But I don't know what God does with the creation that dies before the resurrection of the dead, but I feel very confident that when Jesus comes back, all of the animals will, I think a lot of them, it will be like Narnia and some of them will be talking, but that again, I don't know that either. That's <laughs> just my hope. Well, an animal did talk in the Bible, so yeah, it's, they, I feel like it. they can talk. Yeah. <laughs> but contrast this to, you know, obviously the Bible doesn't, say particularly what happens to pets but we do know that even the psalms are very clear you know creation itself declares forth the praise of god and i will point also people to a few episodes ago we talked on this podcast with phil town about the existence of god from beauty which includes creation so i could direct people there but what happens to people when they die what's the difference between you know that happening to created animals versus created people. When we die, you know, our bodies go into the ground. The Old Testament talks about, you know, Sheol, like it's a sort of holding tank a little bit in the, in the Old Testament. But then in the New Testament, Jesus is very clear that you should repent and believe before you die because you will go on forever. So your soul will live forever either in torment away from him or 
in consolation and happiness with him. And your body is destroyed, but your soul is not destroyed. And so you should trust in him and accept him and then spend forever with him in heaven when you die, but then at the resurrection of the dead, when all people are raised either for judgment or for glory. And I think the death of animals plays into the, you know, I think we push off even our own need for repentance by concentrating so much on the death of animals. We should be anxious about our own deaths and wonder about where we will be when we die and how God will judge or vindicate all those whom he created. So I don't think that this culture thinks about death enough in the right way. And even Christians are so confused about what happens. You do you really don't just sort of go to heaven and become an angel or are given a harp <laughs> or an accordion. You're going to live an embodied existence forever, eventually. And that really has implications for how you live today. I do think that just the influence of the worldview of our culture has influenced the way Christians think, because in our culture, as is evidenced by certain worldviews, whether it be veganism or other things with animals, the rescue of animals, those non-Christians who hold those worldviews would say that there is no difference between humans and animals, but the Bible makes a very clear difference between humans and animals. But given all that, you know, is it okay to grieve when our pets die? How should we grieve? I mean, you know, do we just say, okay, give it up to, you know, be cremated and that's that? Or is it okay to bury our pet on our, if we have the means, if we have a yard, is, is that okay? I mean, how should we handle when our pet dies, what to do with their remains and or how do we even approach grieving is it okay to grieve for something that's a creature, not a human being? I think it's good and right to grieve at the destruction of anything. You know, when people die and you don't even know them, it's okay to grieve then too. I think that it's good to admit, to tell the truth to yourself about how you feel. So even if your grief feels out of control or even a little bit disordered, like you are way more upset about the death of your cat than your mother, you shouldn't just pretend that that's not true. You should admit that it's true and ask God for help and try to get to the root of why did the animal dying, why did that seem so much worse? What's going on? You know, pray about it and ask for help. But I do think it's good to grieve because something that was really good and beautiful was broken or ruined or destroyed and the appropriate response is grief and i do think that burial we've buried a lot of pets in our yard and we have a little service we pray over the animal when it dies and we sing some hymns and we bury the animal it's a really good thing for young children to participate i think in burying an animal in the ground and then talking about the resurrection of the dead on the last day. And when my dog died this year, somebody sent me some bits from the Every Moment Holy Book has a nice liturgy, I think, for the death of a pet and to help, you know, give you language to proclaim the goodness of God and the glory of God in the face of something that you're helpless to amend. So, no, I think you should you should bury your pet. You should grieve. And I'm Anglican, so a lot of Anglican churches, when on St. Francis Day, have blessings of animals and people bring their pets. And I think it's good to pray for your animals. Ask God for real to restore what we have broken and to make it whole again. And some animals are better than other ones and need prayer. <laughs> or maybe the blessing of God. I think as long as you remember that God created man to have dominion over and care for the earth and that he had a unique position and still does, even though it's corrupted 
and we should not worship our pets or idolize them or devour them or misuse them or neglect them, but we should have a rightly ordered relationship with God's creation and grieve when that's broken. Well, on a much lighter note than death, I have some fun rapid fire questions for Anne. Now you've hinted that you have more than one animal. So how many pets do you have and what are their names and what kind of pets are they? I think I have five pets right now. So I have, we have three cats and two dogs and uh, we have, so our, we have a big dog now since the little dog died and his name is Bunter, like um, Lord Peter Whimsey's valet. Uh, and then we have um, a small Chawini named Poseidon, Posey for short, and he is very temperamental and doesn't like children, which is great because I have six children. And then we have three cats. We have a geriatric cat who is wounded in spirit, if that makes sense. Like he's not emotionally well and never will be until he goes to be with the Lord. And his name is Bander, like the the poem Bandersnatch. And then we have a big, fat, beautiful cat named Gloria who wandered into our house one day. And now we have a kitten. I think we're naming him Breeden after Lord Peter Whimsey because my children are reading the Dorothy Sayers books and they're wanting to name everything after Peter Whimsey characters. So Breeden, Lord Peter's name is uh, Peter Breeden Deeth, I think, Whimsy. And so we're trying out Breeden as a name and it's really complicated for <laughs> for a kitten. Okay. And then besides your family, what's the best part of your life right now? Oh, wow. Well. well, I would say that having a kitten has been great and I recommend it as a way to become more cheerful. And then the, I don't want one, but I do like watching people push their cats around in those pink strollers. And there's several people on my block who do that. And I always go and watch them go by. And I, that has really helped me get through COVID. Well, thanks, Anne, for being a guest again on the Postmodern Realities Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. You've been listening to episode 252 of the Postmodern Realities Podcast brought to you by the Christian Research Institute and the Christian Research Journal. Today's guest is Anne Kennedy. She has written an in-depth online exclusive article called Meditation Upon the Death of a Pet. And our subscribers can read her article for free online at our website, equip.org. If you'd like to read her article and are not currently subscriber, please go to equip.org to subscribe to our journal. We'd like to connect to you, so please subscribe to the Bible Answer Man YouTube channel and join in the conversation in the comment section and in the live chat when we have premiere videos. Please follow the Bible Answer Man page on Facebook and on Twitter. You will find us at Hank Hanegraaff, Bible Answer Man, Christian Research Institute, and Christian Research Journal, as well as on Instagram at the Bible Answer Man account. You won't want to miss every Monday through Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern when we live stream the Bible Answer Man broadcast, hosted by CRI President Hank Canegraaff at our website, equip.org. In addition, please subscribe to the Hank Unplugged podcast. Hank gets out of the studio and into his study and engages in in-depth, free-flowing, essential Christian conversations on critical issues with some of the most interesting, informative, and inspirational people on the planet. You'll want to head on over to Equip.org because there you're going to find thousands of free resources for you in articles and past broadcasts, our podcasts, and videos. And thank you for all the ways in which you partner with the Christian Research Institute. Mm-hmm.